Well, hello YouTube, and uh, welcome to this week's video. Also addicts. So this week, we have in store for you a two-parter. One, two. And this week is obviously part one. It is my top 25 dream cars. Money no object, 25 cars, what would I have in my garage? It's going to be a two-parter simply because it takes too long. So I'm going to split it into two halves, probably 15 in this one, and then the next video will be the top 10. They are in generally no particular order. Um, but uh, the, the, the top one, certainly the, maybe the team in the top two are actually my top two, but other than that, they're generally not in any particular order other than as I thought of them and wrote them down. But uh, anyway, part one, first 15. Hope you enjoy. Let's get on with it. But let's start with number 25. And this is an obvious one, it is my 1981 Chevrolet Corvette. I love this car. Um, if you've seen the review on this car I've done, if it's live yet, it might not be live yet. I'm not sure what order these videos are going out. However, you'll see for all its flaws, it's a car I've wanted since I was 8 years old. It's not going anywhere. I love it a bit my 1981 Chevrolet Corvette um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about it you can go and see the review and there's there's lots of videos 20 odd videos on this car on my on my page but uh, yeah so moving on number 24 a Corvette the 1958 1959 uh, C1 Corvette. Um, I specify those years, and possibly even the 1960, but uh, I believe in 61, I think it was, certainly in 62, but I think in 61 they changed the rear end, um, give it the, the more pointed rear end that would um, be on the C2s, and I prefer the rounder, uh, the rounder rump of the earlier ones. I love the very early C1s, but uh, there's just something about the the 58 and 59s that, that I really do love. Um, 58, especially with the two chrome strips down the, 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 the boot, or the trunk, I should say. But uh, yeah, moving sort of away from American cars, we move on to number 23. And I say sort of away, because it is a British car... Um, Italian designed but an American engine and it is the Jensen FF produced between 1966 and 1971 and based on the Interceptor um, a lot of people wrongly call it the Jensen Interceptor FF it's not, it's, it, is the, it is the Jensen FF FF standing for Ferguson Formula denoting its four-wheel drive system. Um, the first non-all-terrain 4x4 produced, um, predating the Quattro, I believe, predating the Audi Quattro by some 13, 14 years. Uh, it was also the first production car with anti-lock brakes, um, a Dunlop Maxarat um, system. Um, it had the 383 Chrysler V8, uh, 6.3 litres, um, with the 727 Torque Flight uh, transmission behind it. Uh, 320 of them were produced, um, all right-hand drive. Uh, he, unfortunately, due to a, we'll say a design hiccup, um, there was an issue with the um, transfer box and the prop shaft uh, protruded sort of into the left hand seat area 
so it couldn't really um, make left hand drive ones it's easy to spot from a, a standard interceptor mainly it's five inches longer and you have um, on the interceptor you have one air vent, one gill if you like, on the wings uh, the FF has two fabulous cars, as I said quite rare now getting very expensive but uh, yeah and that leads me on to another very expensive car number 22 the 1932 to 1937 Duesenberg Model SJ now you're saying no oh, they were launched in 28 no the Model J was launched in 1928 the Model SJ didn't come along till 1932 the S denoting it's supercharged um, built in Indiana with a uh, 420 cubic inch uh, straight 8 or 7 litre thereabouts um, Eli Cord he bought Duesenberg in 1926 um, mainly for the, the Duesenberg brothers uh, mechanical and engineering skills he wanted to build a car to rival the Hispano Suiza and the Rolls Royces things like that at the time and he did. Um, you'll heard certainly at the American uh, saying it's a doozy, meaning something absolutely fantastic. Well, that comes from the Duesenberg. Uh, they're incredible cars. When you think they, they date back in, in J form to 1928 and SJ form to, to 1932. We're talking two and a half to three ton cars here. Uh, that will do 104 miles an hour in second gear. Uh, they'll top out at 140. Not to 60 in 7 seconds. Not to 100 in 17 seconds. From a massive 3 ton car. Incredible vehicles. Um, in SJ form, the supercharged one, 320 horsepower. Um, only 36 SJs made. Uh, there were 300, um, just Model J's made, but only 36 SJ's. Phenomenal cars, I would dearly love one. Leading on to number 21. Again, quite expensive, but a very, very different car. Uh, launched in uh, 1947, uh, the Cisitalia, or Cisitalia 202 GT, it was a Pininfarina design, um, and it was just a, an, an incredible uh, design and, and technical accomplishment. Uh, just post-war design, it's just fantastic. In fact, I'm struggling to to speak. It's such a, a, a pretty car. Um, it was honoured by the. New York's Museum of Modern Art uh, in 1951 uh, where they put one on display um, as one of the eight uh, most uh, beautiful or aesthetically pleasing um, cars ever created. 170 were made uh, between 47 and 52. They space frame chassis with, as I said, a pin for in the design body. Uh, one litre or 1,090 cc Fiat engine uh, only produced 770 horsepower 700? No, sorry, 70 horsepower but only weighed 760 kilos so it would do 100 mile an hour but that's not really the point it, while they're, they're apparently I've obviously never driven one apparently a great driving car they're just stunningly, stunningly beautiful vehicles So, on to number 20, and we're still in the expensive realms here, because in this one it's the 1966 to 1973 Lamborghini Miura. Uh, my personal preference would be the original, the P400 um, from 66, I think they're a very, very stunning vehicle. 
the first mid-engined uh, production supercar, um, the fastest production car of its time. 764 of them built. They were designed by Marcello Gandini, built at Bertoni. 4 litre V12 engine, producing 345 horsepower. I believe the engine was a, a Bizzarini design, who had previously uh, been part of the Ferrari 250 GTO engineering team and went on to, um, alongside ESO, um, produce his own car. Um, originally partly with the ESO Grifo um, and the ESO AC competition car but then went on with his own car the Bizzarini GT Strada a car again I would dearly love although it doesn't quite make this list um, but back to the mirror it, it was produced in secret um, and in the spare time of uh, Lamborghini's engineering team uh, very much against the wishes of, of um, Ferruccio Lamborghini, who preferred a fast, powerful GT car. Um, but it, when it was launched, or when it was debuted, I should say, in the Geneva Motor Show in 1966, uh, the world went crazy for it. Um, and the P400 um, went on to do great, great things. Um, obviously in, in 1973, 74 it was replaced by the now legendary Kuntesh. Um Again, a car that does not feature on this list. But, number 19, the uh, 1954 to 1957 Mercedes-Benz 300SL Gullwing does. Uh, chassis name or Mercedes internal name was the W198 uh, had a 3 litre straight 6 with mechanical direct fuel injection uh, the engine was canted over 50 degrees to the left to keep the bonnet lined low um, I have been told by an owner that can result in um, the bores wearing slightly oval but nowadays these cars generally don't do huge mileage so it's probably not an issue 1400 of them were built so they're not perhaps as rare as one would expect um, they were inspired um, by a Mercedes-Benz authorised uh, American importer Max Hoffman uh, he well, correctly perceived um, there would be big demand for a vehicle like this that was based very much on the 1952 W194 SL race car um, SL uh, being super light uh, referring to the SL's tubular um, construction sort of a, a super legera um, construction uh, over a, there is a steel body obviously put over that there were 29 alloy bodied cars which saved around 80 kilos of weight um, and they are now obviously incredibly sought after cars uh, 240 horsepower uh, 217 pound feet of torque the as a, a point of interest I meant to look up the actual degrees but I forgot but the the helix of the transmission um, cogs was actually differed on the roadsters to make the transmission quieter. Uh, they were much more designed as a, a cruiser. The um, Gullwing was still very much a racer. Um, had a, a swing axle, rear axle, uh, which made the handling interesting if you were uh, not the best driver or not used to it. Um, I have been very, very lucky to have a go in one of these a few years ago. Only very slowly and on private ground, unfortunately, but uh, it was still an absolute thrill until I came to get out of it and had to crawl out on all fours. Not an easy car to get in and out of when you're my size. So we'll move swiftly on to number 18. The Alfa Romeo SZ. 
produced by um, in 89 to 91. It was unveiled at the Geneva Motor Show in 1981 um, on the Zigato stand, just called the ES30, standing for Experimental Sports Car 3 Litre. Uh, contrary to popular belief, Zagato did not actually design the car, however they did build the car. Uh, it was designed in-house... Um, at Alfa Romeo and Fiat. Fiat had obviously recently bought Alfa Romeo um, and I believe, I could be wrong, I should have looked this up, but Robert Oprum had a hand in the design of this from who also designed the Citroen SM. But uh, anyway, mechanically it's very much based on the Alfa 75 uh, 3 litre V6 Phenomenal cars, um, very much a, a love or hate design. I love the design, I think it's a stunning car. Uh, top speed was 152 with an order 60 of 7 seconds. Doesn't seem that fast, but it was all about handling. The suspension and chassis was very much race car um, inspired, and while it was nothing special in itself, very very hard and minimal bushing um, to, to so there's not a lot of deflection in any of the joints so it's very much a handling car uh, 207 horsepower again not you know a big deal but for its time it wasn't bad there were 1036 SZs made um, and followed up closely by 278 RZ Roadsters uh, which personally I think lost a little bit in the looks. But sticking with Zagato, we move on to 17 and the 1986 to 1990 Aston Martin V8 Vantage Zagato. Um, I'm not going to say a huge amount about these cars. Um, there's plenty to look up on the online. Um, they are a, a Fabulous car, again very much like the SZ, a, a very div div divisive design, you either love them or hate them, and again I, I absolutely adore them. Uh, they came with a standard Aston Martin 5.3 litre V8, uh, 470 horsepower, capable of 186 miles an hour. Um, initially 52 coupes were made. Um, they then went on to make 37 convertibles, um, obviously for a, a total of, of 89 cars, so a very rare car, um, 186 mile an hour top speed. Some of them, mainly the convertibles that I've seen, did have a retractable cover over the headlights. Um, I personally prefer the standard look, um, generally the coupe. Uh, but again, as I said, it is a, a very divisive style. As is number 16. Also an AM product, uh, the Aston Martin Lagonda. Or, to give it its correct name, it, the Lagonda. Uh, it's not technically an Aston Martin, it is Lagonda. Lagonda was supposedly meant to be a separate brand. Now... Specifically, I'm talking about the Wedge versions, which were the Series 2 onwards. They did do a Series 1 of 74 and 75, which was basically a, just a lengthened V8. Um, a very nice car in its own right, but I love the madness of the William Towns uh, styled Wedge Lagondas. Um, launched in 76... Uh, the Series 2 had um, mad LED dashboard, one of the first um, cars to have electronic type dashboards. Um, the and a, a crazy interior, single spoke steering wheel, it is fabulous, fabulous vehicles, pop up headlights and, and the Series 3s went even crazier with um, moisture sensitive touch buttons or capacitive touch buttons and CRT cathode ray tube um, 
monitors for the dash instrumentation basically uh, CRT for those that don't know is, is what TVs used to be or what I still actually have in my living room but uh, uh, the, the TVs that you know were stuck out for miles not the sort of modern slimline things you hang on the wall um, Series 4's they, they did do a redesign this was about 1987 um, where internally it went very much more conventional uh, sort of a, a standard two spoke Aston Martin steering wheel normal dashboard um, outside however they did clean it up a lot you lost the pop up lights and just grow, gained a row of um, three square lights on each side um, the rear went from the two separate lights to a, a single bar right across the back and I personally think externally it's by far the best looking of the, the wedge ones. Um, if I could have a Series 3 interior in a Series 4 exterior, it would be my perfect car. But uh, ah, it's not to be. Um, again, the 5.3 Aston V8. Um, less power than in the Vantage. Uh, mere 280 horsepower. Um, 302 pound feet of torque, good for 143 miles an hour and an auto 60 of 8.8 .8 seconds. Um, great cars, only 645 made, uh, 105 of those being the Series 4s. Fabulous cars. Um, the next car I think really does not have divisive styling. I think most people absolutely love the way these things look. And that is the 1992 to 1994 Jaguar XJ220. And yes, it is a Jaguar, not Jaguar. There is no W for my American people out there. But uh, anyway, built by Jaguar um, in conjunction with Tom Walkinshaw Racing. Unfortunately, the, uh, the car that was shown at the Motor Show had four wheel drive and a V12 engine and fabulous looking thing was slightly toned down by the time production came along um, the V12 turned into a three and a half litre V6 uh, a V6 with some pedigree however it had been in the 6R4 um, Group B rally car or basically that engine had been um, didn't have the four wheel drive a lot of forward part spin instrumentation on the interior but importantly it kept that absolutely stunning stunning uh, bodywork yes the v6 didn't sound anything special but it did go fairly it was for a time the fastest production car in the world 217 mile an hour top speed uh, 0 to 16 in 4.8 seconds for 1992 was was something um, fantastic. Uh, 542 horsepower, 475 pound feet of torque. Um, unfortunately, only 282 of them were produced. Um, they were launched straight into a recession, um, and unfortunately, Jaguar struggled to sell them. Now, however, um, times have changed. Uh, number 14, Jaguar had no problem trying to sell because they only ever produced one of them. And that is the 1966 Jaguar XJ13. One-off prototype designed to go racing in Le Mans. Never happened. Uh, designed by the legendary Malcolm Sayer. Also designed the C type, the D type, the E type, it just fabulous, fabulous. Uh, had a 5 litre double overhead cam V12. Uh, it was very much also a test bed for the V12 engine that went on to be in the E type, the XJS, the XJ saloons in 5.3 uh, form. Unfortunately, 27, 21st of January 1971, while Norman Dewis was uh, testing the car at Myra one of the magnesium wheels broke up um, and it crashed. Uh, Norman Dewis was okay, he, he 
flung himself down into the, the, sort of the footwell area um, but the car didn't fare quite so well uh, it was shoved into a corner at the Browns Lane factory um, until a few years later um, when it was noticed by one of the CEOs who had it rebuilt and restored and to this day it is still uh, part of the Jaguar Dome Heritage Fleet uh, now at Gaydon uh, since the Brown Lane, Browns Lane Museum has closed. Um, I have sat in it. Um, it, would, was just, it was an honour to do just that. To drive it would be incredible. Um, now, obviously, this is on my top 25 car list. I'm not going to have that car. It's a one-off car. Jaguar was unlikely to ever sell it. But there are various pro, um, replicas or recreations out there. Um, obviously, I, you know you, you can get the, the cheap and nasty ones that look vaguely like it. But there are some out there for you know, eighty, ninety, hundred thousand pounds will build you an exact replica, and I would have one of those stunning cars. So, unlucky for some, number 13. And it was unlucky, if you like, for Bugatti. Uh, because the company failed after they produced this. It should have been a halo car, and it has become that. But the Bugatti EB110, produced from 91 to 95, EB, Ettore Bugatti, and 110 because uh, that would have been his he would have been 110 on the 15th of September 1991 and it was that date the first three rolled down the production line uh, the first three of 139 that were eventually produced um, before the company went into liquidation in 1995 um, it's obviously since been bought by the Volkswagen Audi group and produce things like the, the the Veyron and the Chiron and what have you. But back to the EB110. Uh, 3.5 litre quad turbo V12. 553 horsepower. The uh, 603 in the Super Sport version. Uh, 0 to 60 of 3.6 seconds. And a top speed of 209 miles an hour in 1991. Just, just, just phenomenal. Phenomenal. Great looking cars, unlike a lot of supercars of the period. The interior was exceptionally well trimmed. Quite a luxurious supercar. Um, for years they were in the supercar, dol supercar doldrums. Obviously not cheap enough for peasants like myself, but by supercar standards they were very, very cheap. They have now, with Bugatti regaining some sort of a, a fashion, if you like, with, with you know everyone going mad for the Veyrons and things it, they have started to be noticed again and prices are going up prices have also gone up over the last few years of number 12 on my list a car I say this a lot and if you're using my videos for a drinking game this word is, is, is the one to have a shot by but a car I absolutely adore and that is the Citroen SM from 1970 to 1975. It was the 1971 European Car of the Year. Designed by Robert Opran. Um, we spoke earlier with regard to the uh, Alpha SZ. Came with either the 2.7 or later the 3 litre Maserati V6 um, out of the Bora, I think. Might have been the Merec. I think it was the Bora. Not sure. Uh, 174 horsepower. Top speed of 137 and 0 to 60 in 8.5 seconds. But that really doesn't such grasp how great these cars are. Uh, Citroen purchased Maserati in 1968. Again, mainly for the engines and the engineering. And uh, with the demise of the, the DS... And the CX replacing it. This was sort of a, a, a real sports grand tourer 
with the hydrogen pneumatic suspension and steering and brakes of the CX. A beautiful bodywork, as I've said, by Robert Opran. And that Maserati V6 engine. It's just just a stunning, stunning car. Uh, 12,920 made. Um, a car that a lot of people are scared of. That Maserati engine scares them. And possibly rightly so there. The hydrogen pneumatic suspension scares people, which isn't really fair. It's actually quite a simple system. But uh, a, a very complex car to restore. Um, so you really do need to buy a good one. And a good one is now well above 50,000. But uh, uh, the next car on my list has also fluctuated in value quite a lot the last few years shooting up um, heavily a couple of years ago now settling back down and that is number 11 the 1961 to 1975 Jaguar E-Type again I'm not going to say a huge amount about the Jaguar E-Type anyone that knows anything about cars knows about the Jaguar E-Type I have pictures of the Jaguar E-Type on my wall I have uh, paintings, um, specifically of 9,600 HP, which uh, Philip Porter owns. I have books on the Jaguar E-Type. If you want to know about the Jaguar E-Type, just, just Google it. It is a fascinating car, a fascinating story of, of Norman Dewis shooting across some Browns Lane to the Geneva Motor Show for the 1961 launch overnight. It's just a phenomenal, phenomenal car. Even Enzo Ferrari himself said it was the most beautiful car ever made. And uh, I think if you look at the 250 GTO, you can see he meant that because there's a lot of similarities there. Um, fabulous, fabulous cars. I absolutely adore them. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed those first 15. Come back for part two. For the, uh, for the top 10. I'll see you then. As always, like, share, subscribe, and I'll see you on the next one. Ta-da!